Hey, this is Power Card, aka Project Pat. And you're listening to the Baltimore Beatdown Podcast, the best Ravens podcast on the planet. It's pretty incredible. In fact, it's la marvelous. <laughs> Thank you guys. What's up, you guys? It's Jake here, uh, coming to you guys uh, with an early week episode. Not entirely sure when I'm going to be releasing this, but I uh, wanted to go ahead and record a quick opener here for today's episode which is uh, going to be featuring my chat with John Feinstein. John is a uh, longtime author who's based out of the D.C. area. Uh, he's done some really awesome work uh, chronicling uh, different you know, seasons over the course of different sports in certain books that he's done. He's uh, done a book on uh, Bob Knight and Indiana basketball. He's done a book on the PGA Tour, and he did one in 2004 on the Baltimore Ravens uh, and the season that they had that year. Uh, getting up close and personal with the organization, getting to know a lot of the guys, a lot of the figures in the front office, a lot of the players. Uh, and like I said, he turned this into the 2004 book, Next Man Up, which is a, uh, a really awesome read. I found myself going back to it recently, uh, went all the way through it, got in touch with John, uh, asked him if he wanted to uh, hop on the show and chat with me about it. He was kind enough to do so. He hopped on with me here uh, for about an hour earlier this morning, talking all about the book, all about that season, what it was like, gives a lot of really good context on what that season uh, was like for him to follow and also was like for the organization and also gives a lot of behind the scenes stuff, really, really interesting information on Bashadi, on Ozzie Newsom, on Brian Billick, on a lot of the players. And this is one that I would definitely recommend listening to, uh, even if you haven't read it or uh, if you want to go ahead and read it and maybe save this one for after you're done. Uh, you know, you could do that. You could also just listen to it right now, maybe read it later. Uh, but even without the book, I think this is a great chat. Uh, it goes into a lot of really cool Ravens historical stuff that I think you guys are going to enjoy. So don't want to hold you up here for too much longer before we get into the chat, because like I said, it is a long one and a really good one, and it kind of speaks for itself. So uh, without further ado, you guys have a great week. We'll talk to you uh, near the end of the week. And uh, here's my chat in the meantime with John Feinstein. All right. We now welcome on a very special guest. It is author John Feinstein. Thanks for joining the show, sir. Jake, my pleasure. How are you? Doing all right here. Uh, checking in after the night of the uh, the Super Bowl. So uh, uh, going to be kind of an interesting morning energy level wise, I think, for both of us. But uh, starting things off, if you wouldn't mind kind of explaining to the audience a little bit, uh, just kind of a little bit about yourself and kind of your career to set things up here. Well, I'm, I'm not sure how much detail you want. Uh, I, I grew up in New York City. Uh, I was more or less a failed jock. I went to college as a swimmer. Uh, I got hurt. I broke an ankle uh, early on, uh, falling down a flight of steps sober, which is pretty embarrassing, and uh, started working at the student newspaper at that point, uh, largely because friends of mine told me it was a good place to meet girls, and it was. But I also enjoyed the work. Ended up uh, getting an internship after I graduated at the Washington Post uh, and then got hired, believe it or not, as the night police reporter because there were no openings in sports and they wanted me to stick around, which was great. And that turned out to be one of the most important things that ever happened in my life because I ended up working for Bob Woodward on the Metro staff. And that was like getting a Ph.D. in journalism. Uh, went back to sports because that was always my passion uh, when I had the chance. And uh, then wrote my first book in 1986, Season on the Brink, about Bob Knight. And uh, basically went from there and was always, I was fortunate because of the success Season on the Brink had that I've pretty much been able to pick and choose my topics, my book topics, uh, ever since then. Yeah, and I think that's a good segue because we wanted to get you on here to uh, take a trip down memory lane with you uh, with your uh, book, Next Man Up, uh, from 2004, which is a chronicling, I guess you could call it, of the Baltimore Ravens 2004 season. I just kind of returned to it recent, recently, reached out to you on a whim to talk about it a little bit. So first of all, kind of take me through how exactly the idea of following a team for a year kind of came to be for you and how it wound up being with Baltimore. Well, I'd done a number of books 
that revolved around following a season in some form. Obviously, the first one was season on the brink when I spent the 85-86 basketball season with Bob Knight. Uh, I did another uh, season book on college basketball after that. I did another season book on ACC basketball. I did a season with the Patriot League uh, in basketball. I did a year on the tennis tour, a year on the golf tour. And that book, A Good Walk Spoiled, actually outsold season on the brink. So that it was, it was an MO that I had used fairly often. And even though I had not covered the NFL very much, uh, through the years, I covered it some working at the Washington Post. Um, uh, I always had in, in the back of my mind an idea that if you could get access to an NFL team uh, for a season, there were a lot of inside stories to be told. Because as you know, Jake, the media probably has less access to the NFL uh, than any team sport. Uh, pra- access to practice is limited. There's controlled times when you're allowed to be in the locker room during the week. Uh, there just isn't that much access. And so I thought if I could get that kind of access, I could tell a story that many that, that hadn't really been told in the past. Uh, you might remember Paper Lion, which uh, is a book I read as a, as a kid. Uh, but that book ended with the start of the Detroit Lions exhibition season. It went nowhere near the regular season. So um, I, 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 I knew that Brian Billick was good with the media. Uh, I also knew that Ozzie Newsom was very careful with the media. But my my in, really, was Steve Bishotti. Uh Steve Bishotti was is, was and is, as you know, very good friends with Gary Williams, uh, who was then the Maryland basketball coach and who's someone I've known since he was coaching at American University when I was a kid reporter at the Post. And I asked Gary if he could hook me up with Steve, which he did. And I started to explain myself on the phone to Steve. And he said, look, I know who you are. And I know Gary trusts you. And if Gary trusts you, I trust you. I'll set up a meeting for you. So we did. The meeting was Steve, uh, Ozzy Newsom, Brian Billick, and Kevin Byrne, who was the Ravens PR guy for about 100 years, getting back to Cleveland until he retired this past summer. And the first question Ozzy Newsom asked me in the meeting was, ESPN pays us millions of dollars for, for uh, TV rights. Uh, why? And I don't let them into my draft war room. Why would I let you in? Which was a good question. Um, and my answer was simple. I don't come with a TV camera. Uh, a, a TV camera recording what's going on live often doesn't give context. Uh, if something happened in the draft room that was controversial or, you know, something went wrong, whatever it might be, I would then have plenty of time to talk to everybody who was in the room about what happened and why, whereas a TV camera doesn't do that. And so that was my answer. And we went from there. And in the end, I think uh, it, it, Steve was probably had the tiebreaker vote, I think is the way, best way to put it. I'm sure, and I get along great with Ozzy now. Um, he was terrific as the season went on and actually wrote me a note about how much he liked the book when it came out. I really appreciated that a lot. But I think back then, Ozzy would have voted no, Billick would have voted yes, and Steve was the tiebreaker. So once I got approval uh, from the team, I went from there. This is a little bit of a non sequitur. I didn't actually even write this down, but like, what do you make of the way that like the media has evolved since then, including social media? And like, you now have that show all or nothing that basically like makes all this money doing the exact same thing, but for TV, what do you make of all that stuff? Do you think you were kind of at the forefront of that? I don't know if I would ever describe myself as being at the forefront. I think if I was at the forefront, uh, it was with season on the brink, which was probably the, the first inside book written by an outsider. Um, my, my real model for that book was Jim Bouton's Ball Four, but of course Jim Bouton was an active player when he wrote that book. Um, and I was a, a, a clear outsider when I wrote Season on the Brink. I, I think the world has just changed, Jake. Um, social media has changed it radically. Uh, and uh, can, people, cameras are now allowed inside locker rooms. And but I'm always amused when they are because you can tell that the, the, the coaches are performing for the cameras. And one of the things that I've always tried to do when I've had access is to be as invisible as possible. And uh, when Steve Alford wrote his book on his experiences playing for Bob Knight, called Cleverly Enough Playing for Knight, 
he described me as the invisible man uh, when I was there during his junior year. And that was a high, a huge compliment. And that's what I, I, I want to be part of the furniture uh, to the players, to the coaches as, as, as the year wears on. And I think I was able to do that with the Ravens. Yeah. I think that's also uh it's kind of funny because I was talking to Pete Gilbert from WBAL. I don't know if you know Pete at all, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we were talking about it. And I mentioned that I was reading the book. He was like, Oh yeah, I remember John, like we would do the press conferences and then he would like duck off and like follow the team into the building. And I was like, what's this guy doing? But uh, yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. And uh, I did want to compliment you on that because I think uh, you were, you know, you did do a really good job being a fly on the wall. And as, as much as I do like all or nothing and like hard knocks still to this day, it does kind of feel a little bit at this point, like they're just kind of commercials for the team that they're covering. So I think years kind of hard knocks has, has, has kind of I mean, the Ravens was first team to do hard knocks, as yep. you know. Uh, but I think it's kind of run its course. Yeah, I agree. Um, Cause I, I, I was a watcher of hard knocks too. And then watched it even this season. Um, but it, it, it's kind of run, run its course. And, but I, I, I think the, what what amuses me is when TV people describe themselves as insiders. This is insider so and so, insider so and so. Usually, what they're doing, like Adam Schefter is the classic insider. Ninety five percent of his information comes from agents who are trying to, you know, puff up their clients. Understandably, um, but I think the, in the books that I've done, I've been able to actually really be inside. I, I remember one of Ray Lewis used to give these fascinating prayers, pregame prayers. He would go on for quite a while. He would ask God for, for many, many different things. And I always had my tape recorder and I would stand on the outside of the circle while they were praying and, and tape the, uh, the, the prayers. Cause they, you know, if you read the book, I, I repeated some of them cause they were very interesting. And I remember at one point, Terrell Suggs looked back at me and said, you recording the prayer? And I said, yeah, Terrell, it's interesting. And he goes, yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it's it's really cool, like the, just that whole kind of idea that you brought into it. And as someone who for this podcast has undertaken like sort of similar projects, definitely on obviously a much smaller scale, uh, I, even I like have trouble like how I'm going to approach stuff sometimes. I have to imagine it was maybe and maybe not by that point if you had been doing it for 20 or whatever years, but was it kind of daunting going into doing this kind of a project? And what was kind of your process in that regard? Did you kind of go in, into it with a big approach or were you just pretty open-minded? You know, it's always daunting when you start a project, whatever it is, especially when almost no one knows who you are when you walk in. Uh, Bill, Billick knew who I was. Ozzy knew who I was. Some of the scouts did. Uh, but I don't think any of the players knew who I was. And so it was kind of key that I get there early. Um, March, April, OTAs, uh, even when guys were just hanging around to, to work out during the off season and get to know them then. And what, what, what I always try to do is do a sit down with guys, whether it's, it's Kyle Bowler, who was, who was key to the book or Ray Lewis, who was obviously key to the book or anybody else. Um, and so I get to know their life story. And so they get to know me and that's, important that they know me. And then I, what I try to do after that is talk to them without a tape recorder, just chat. You know, if I, if I know someone is a, a you know, like Kyle Buller grew up in California. So I might ask him about the, the no Cal te professional teams or about his alma mater, uh, Cal Berkeley. Um, so you, you, and I, I, this is something I try to do all the time. The more time you can spend with people without a notebook or a tape recorder in your hands, the more they're going to come to trust you because when you walk up to them, it's not just a reporter walking up, it's a person. And so that, that, that was my basic approach right from the beginning. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that comes through pretty well. And you have kind of already hit on Bashadi, Billick and Ozzy up to this point. And they did sound like they were really crucial to the project and kind of the three sort of horsemen that you had to get sign off there. What would you say your first impression of each of those three guys were? Well, um, Steve, I, I've always referred to Steve as, as being the anti Dan Snyder. Um, <laughs> yeah, I read, that was a good line in the book. <laughs> Dan Snyder wants everybody in his life, including I think his wife and children, to call him Mr. Snyder. Um, Steve makes a point of saying to people, if they call him Mr. Bashadi, he says it's Steve. So I still remember walking into the facility, uh, the old one uh, in Owings Mills, the, the day I was going to meet with Steve and Ozzy and, 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 and Brian and Kevin Byrne. And I was standing at the, you know, security desk. And I said, I have a meeting with blah, blah, blah. And just as I said it, 
Steve walked in right behind me and the security guard said, oh, here's Steve now. Now, if he'd done that in, in the Washington football team uh, facility, he'd probably been fired on the spot. And that Steve has never been impressed with the fact that he's made a lot of money. Uh, he looks at it. Yes, I worked hard. I was also lucky. Uh, he doesn't think being rich makes him better or more important than other people. Uh, and that makes him very easy to work with and to deal with. Um, and, and he's always, I, Tom Watson and I have run a charity golf tournament to raise money for ALS research since 2005, which was the year after I, I did, uh, 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 next man up. And, uh, Steve has been a part of that financially and coming and playing in the golf tournament from the very beginning. That's who Steve is. Um, Ozzy is very, it, it, it's not fair to say that Ozzy is uh, media shy. He is, but one of the, I think one of the reasons for that is he just doesn't want too much focus on him. Uh, I'm working on a book right now on uh, race and sports because I believed for years, long before George Floyd, uh, that race is the elephant in the room in our society and in sports too. And I, when I called Ozzy to talk to him for this book, he asked me about 20 questions about why would you want to talk to me? And I said, Ozzy, you're, you're an historical figure. You're the first African-American general manager in the NFL. You're the first guy to put together a team that won a Super Bowl, two Super Bowls, in fact. But he really did, wasn't eager to do it. He did it because we have a relationship and because I think he trusts me. And by the way, when we sat down and talked, he was fantastic. Uh, but Oz, Ozzy's media shy. Billick, 180 degrees the other way. I mean, Brian would talk to, to anybody. He's smart. He's eloquent. Um, we, we had a running joke throughout that season because Brian is his fr- not as far right politically as I am left, but he's definitely to the right and I'm definitely to the left. And it was an election year, 2004. And so we argued on politics constantly. And, and I remember saying to him at one point, I, I said, Brian, you and I have a problem here because we're both people who think when we walk into a room, we're the smartest guy in the room. And when we're in a room together, only one of us can be the smartest guy. And it's me. Um, <laughs> but he, he was, you know, he, he again, was terrific gave me all the time I could have wanted and all the access I could have wanted because basically as the coach since he controlled the locker room he was critical to making sure I got all the access I needed right and so I guess jumping into uh the team itself like setting the stage a little bit they were coming off of a playoff appearance in 03 they had kind of a disappointing home loss but they had Super Bowl hopes for 04 and uh that's kind of what you were walking into when you started the project how would you describe the overall mood of the organization when you first started covering them well, I think going into the season, you're right. They had high hopes for 2004. They'd made the playoffs with a rookie quarterback, Kyle Bowler. Uh, they had lost on a, a, a last-second field goal uh, to the Titans in the playoffs. Iro- ironically, Gary Anderson, who made that field goal, uh, had missed a field goal that would have sent the Vikings to the Super Bowl in 1999 when Brian Billick was the offensive coordinator. And Brian's first comment after the game was, now he makes it. Um, but... Uh, you know, with Kyle now being in his second year, uh, Jamal Lewis was coming off an historic season. He had problems during the off season, uh, which was definitely part of the book. Um, Ray Lewis was as good a linebacker as there was in football at the time. They had a, a great defense, which they'd had for several years. Uh, so there was every reason to think that at the very least, they were going to be a playoff team. And, and, and then things went wrong, really starting from game one in Cleveland. Uh, when they, got, I think they lost twenty to three. The offense did nothing, obviously, um, and uh, they were beaten soundly by a Browns team that wasn't all that good. It wasn't a terrible Browns team, but not a great Browns team. But then they came back and beat the Steelers. And I, ironically, it was in that game that I, I'm forgetting the name of the Steelers' starting quarterback who had come from the XFL. But he got hurt in that game, and the Steelers put a rookie named Ben Roethlisberger into the game. And he's still playing the position 17 years later. But uh, it was a very up and down season uh, and really climaxed on the wrong end with the losses in Indianapolis and Pittsburgh, the 14th, 15th, 14th and 15th games, 15th and 16th weeks of the season. And, and it was a long shot going into that last game against the Dolphins that they were going to make the playoffs. So 
it was very disappointing in many ways. I, I had hoped to be writing about it, a team that made a run in the playoffs. But I've always believed, Jake, that my books are not dependent on the success of a team. Season When I wrote Season on the Brink, uh, I, I remember sitting next to Jackie McMullen, whose name you may know from ESPN. Back then, she was working for the Boston Globe while Indiana was losing to Cleveland State in the first round of the NCAA tournament. I remember Jackie saying to me, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. You've worked so hard. You spent so t- much time on this, and now they lose in the first round. And I, I remember at that moment thinking, still got a pretty good book here. And I felt that way about the Ravens book. Probably would have sold more in Baltimore if they had been a playoff team. Um, or if they'd won the Super Bowl. Um, but I still thought I had a pretty good book, even coming out of that last game when they finished nine and seven and didn't make the playoffs. Yeah, and I think that's a credit to the book is that it's not just like a Wikipedia page. Like you can go back and like read what happens, you know, game by game, week by week. But I think you do a good job capturing all the characters of the uh, the season and, uh, you know, prior to the regular season. And then I guess in the regular season, one of the big characters of the book is Terrell Owens. Uh, You have that whole saga where he essentially he's still with San Francisco. He vetoes a trade to come to the Ravens. He instead goes to Philadelphia, kind of forces his way there. I'm really curious, like from your perspective as kind of a neutral observer, what it was like to be just sort of in the middle of all that. You said you kind of like to take that fly on the wall approach, but were you kind of conflicted and then you had this really chaotic situation that was unfolding in front of you with these guys you were just kind of getting to know, I would assume maybe like even a little bit versus the fact that you knew it was going to provide really good content for the book? Well, uh, I, I, I was there the day the Terrell Owens uh, trade happened and then didn't happen. I, I was by then I was already reporting the book and I was there and um, it, it was going to be a big deal. I remember them planning the press conference to introduce him. And um, I, I, Ozzie was I, Ozzie doesn't get jubilant, but Ozzie was obviously happy because they needed wide receivers uh, desperately. I mean, that you, you, people talk a lot about Bowler not being great. He didn't really have anybody to throw to, which was a, a big – Todd Heap was kind of the list. The wide receivers were, were guys basically off the, off the, the, the scrap heap. The more, the more things change, the more they stay the same with this team. <laughs> it's true. You know, it's funny because I, I did a book a few years ago uh, on playing quarterback in the NFL, and one of the guys I worked with was Joe Flacco. And Joe got a lot of criticism that year. Again, that was a team that everybody thought was going to make the playoffs, and they finished 9-7, and seven, lost that game to the Bengals uh, at the very end. Um, but honestly, I, so I saw a lot of those games. Not all of them, but I saw a lot. Of, and, and Joe might have had more passes dropped that year than any quarterback in history. I mean, Rashad Breeland, I, he's obviously gone on and played better, but at that point he couldn't catch Colt, much less catch football. But anyway um, – so obviously getting Owens would have been a huge thing uh, and, and, and would have boosted their, their hopes to be a, a serious playoff team. And then it fell apart. And, uh, mo- and it's interesting. It fell apart for the exact reasons why I think Terrell Owens only played on one Super Bowl team because he's a pain in the butt and he didn't want to come to Baltimore. I don't think he wanted to be in a disciplined locker room. I, I mean, one of the reasons – Ozzy was willing to make the trade was because he felt he had a locker room that could handle Terrell Owens. Uh, Ray Lewis was the clear leader, but there were a lot of respected veterans who you wouldn't expect Owens to mess with, so to speak. Um, And that's why he was willing to make the trade. And then Terrell Owens just shut it down and said he didn't want to go there and ended up with the Eagles. What's it like sitting in the draft room of an NFL front office and kind of having to take note of all this where there's so much chaos and confusion flying around? And like you mentioned the cameras and social media these days, like every draft nowadays, like the Ravens have a camera in there and they immediately like tweet out the video after they make the pick. And it's all very ju- notice They don't tweet anything out until they've made. the pick. Yeah, it's all jubilant, like clapping each other on the back. And, you know, it's like obviously that's probably not entirely the picture of what's going on. So I'm curious, like from your perspective, that fly on the wall perspective, what that was. Well, like. it's interesting that you mentioned the cameras, because when I was doing the four quarterback book, um, uh, Eric DaCosta told me the story of the, of the day they drafted Flacco. And you, what happens is that Kevin Byrne um, will come in with the camera crew right after they've made the pick. And But Kevin was in the bathroom when they picked Flacco. And so they, you know, time went on and finally uh, he came back and, and they told him that they picked Flacco. And so they restaged the reaction, including DaCosta running out into the hallway 
uh, and sh shouting down the hall at the offensive coaches, we got our guy. And that was all staged. Um, so, but being in there the way I was in there was different, of course. And what I remember most vividly is the Ravens didn't have a first round pick that year because they had traded their first round pick to get bowler the year before. And I remember at one point late in the first round, because you're just sitting and watching the, the, you know, there were some phone calls back and forth, but really nothing was happening. And I remember Ozzie Newsom turning to, to the scouts. Uh, Phil Savage was the, was the number two guy at that point and saying, I will never trade my number one draft pick again. I can't live through this. Um, and so it, it, it was different because they didn't have a number one pick. But then as you get in the later rounds, it really gets chaotic because you, they're, they're trading up, they're trading down, uh, they're on the phone. And, and Ozzy was clearly in charge. Uh, but he, he consulted with Billick. He consulted with Savage. He consulted with DaCosta, who was the, back then the, the chief college scout. And he would look at Bashadi and say, Steve, here's what I want to do. And, and Steve would sometimes ask questions. You know, are, do we want this guy because? Do we not want this guy? What's the cost going to be uh, if, we, if we make this trade? Um, and, but I remember Bashadi telling me later that his deal with Ozzy was always, if you're going to make a big move, let me know before it goes public so I don't have to get phone calls from my friends saying, did you hear what your team did? And again, that's more anti-Dan Snyder, who we know used to, well, probably still does, come off his yacht to make draft picks. Yeah, he does. I have plenty of uh, WFT uh, fan friends that are not not too fond of the way things are, are run down there, unfortunately. But uh, Nor should they be. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, like, so you're walking into this locker room that – I guess jumping into training camp here a little bit. I mentioned Terrell Owens. That's obviously a big character. It didn't wind up materializing, but you're still walking into a locker room with a ton of characters. You have Ray Lewis and Ed Reed in their primes, a young Terrell Suggs, like you mentioned. Who was the guy right from the jump you realized was going to kind of jump off the pages of the uh, the final product of the book? Well, honestly, it was Bowler, uh, who was not a great player, uh, but was a terrific guy. And the success of the team uh, as with most NFL teams, was going to rise and fall with how well he played. And it was almost like everybody in the locker room, including Kyle, was trying to talk themselves into the notion that Kyle was the guy and was going to be the guy. You know, I remember seeing an ESPN interview with Ray Lewis and him talking about how much more confident Kyle was. And, and at one point he said Kyle was confident in the huddle. And I'm thinking, why were you in the offensive huddle, Ray? But um, – but you can make the case that offensive guys told him that. Um, but, and, but Kyle was also a terrific guy. I mean, really one of the nicest guys I've met in sports. He, he was, couldn't have been more cooperative. And then there was the intrigue of Brian Billick bringing Jim Fossil on strictly to be Bowler's tutor um, and, and to be the quarterback whisperer. And Fossil was an interesting character in himself. I, you know, and we got into a sort of quote unquote tradition and on Monday nights, uh, Bowler and Fossil would go to dinner. And after a while, they invited me to go along, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, fun, literally for me, just as a person. I was curious I like how you swung that because I was like, is he sitting there eating dinner with them? Like, that's pretty. Yeah, yeah that's funny. I was. And uh, I, I don't even remember. I, I think Kyle just invited me. And I mean, we were talking about how he and Jim had gotten into this routine of going out to dinner. There's a, a very good Ruth's Chris right near the facility. Um, and, 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 and I think at one point he said, if you want to come along, that'd be fine. So I went and, and I just kept going. I mean, the food was good. Um, and the company was very good. So, um, but, but, but there were, like you said, there were plenty of characters, uh, in, in that room. Mike Flynn was a character. Uh, who'd come from nowhere to be the starting center. Uh, Ray, of course, was the character. Um, Ed Reed was terrific. Um, Matt Stover was, was great. I, I, Matt Stover said something to me that no athlete, I think before or since, has ever said, because Matt, deeply religious, and of course there were, there were issues within the team over the religious leadership, the spiritual leadership, which was an interesting aspect of the story. But... Matt was, was one of those guys who, after he'd kick a field goal, would go like this. And, and I asked him about it. And I said, I, I, and he said, notice, because I hadn't, notice I do the same thing when I miss. He said, because what I'm doing is I'm thanking God for the opportunity, not for making the kick. And I thought that was kind of a cool thing. 
you know, I, I, that he, again, somebody who was deeply religious, felt that he should thank God for opportunity. And I, I, I always, excuse me, I always prefer an athlete who says that as a pro, that when I did my book on, on the Army Navy football rivalry, um, Charlie Weatherby was the Navy coach. Again, very devout. Uh, the t- they used to pray as a team on game day, literally like seven times. And he would ask God for great pad level in his pregame prayer. I'm going, can you just see God sitting up there? And some guy says, hey, God, how about giving us great pad level today? I, I, I don't like it when athletes go over the top with the notion that, that they won because God wanted them to win. What did God have against the other guy or the other team? But uh, uh, Matt wasn't like that. And uh, so I, I, I enjoyed and I enjoyed a lot of the guys who weren't stars because um, sometimes they have the most intriguing stories. Flynn would be a good example of that. Um, and I still remember, I, I don't know if Mike's still doing Baltimore TV, but he did it for a number of years after he retired because he was so good at stuff like that. I remember walking down the hall with the players because, you know, the players leave the locker room and they walk down the hall to the tunnel where they're introduced. And so I'm walking down the hall one day with Flynn or Flynn's walking with me, depending on your point of view. And Mike had missed a couple games. And when, when you're injured and you're not going to be introduced, you don't go down the hall. You just go out the locker room door and walk behind the bench onto the field. And Mike said, he said, you know, when you walk out the door and you turn right and you just walk onto the field from there, you're just another guy. But when you walk down this hallway and you're going to get introduced in front of all these people, you feel like you're a god. And that was a great line. The other guy I really enjoyed was Peter Bulwer, who was one of the brighter guys I've ever met in sports. Ran for Congress, actually, in Florida after he retired. And I remember him saying to me, you know, I'm fine financially because he had already had a string of car dealerships. He said, but when I retire, I'm, something's going to go out of my life. He said, when I sell a car, there aren't going to be 70,000 people on their feet screaming my name. That's different. And that's a great description of what athletes go through when they retire. Yeah, I think that was a really great line, one that I kind of keyed on as well. And it kind of reminds me of uh, actually, unfortunately, one of the uh, journalists from NFL.com who I really grew up admiring just passed away this past weekend. And one of his uh, his sort of lines was that, like, how do you as a journalist, like reconcile the relative meaninglessness of sports? And I think it right. uh, to me, it kind of comes down to finding meaning in things and like how these guys do it. They obviously take it to this massive, massive level, but uh, I think that's just something that I I thought was really well done. But also speaking of big personalities, you were behind the scenes for the Deion Sanders situation. Can you kind of recall that, that kind of hearing the first time a comeback was possible for him, what that whole process was like? Yeah. You know, uh, it's funny because I had known Dion back in 1992 when I did my first baseball book, he was playing at that point for the Braves and the Falcons. Um, and there was a famous weekend during the playoffs where he played, uh, in Pittsburgh for the Braves on Saturday night, chartered a plane to Miami for a football game at one o'clock on Sunday and came back Sunday night and got there in the bottom of the first inning. And some of the Braves were very upset with him because they saw it's kind of a publicity stunt. CBS sent a camera crew to follow him. Um, and I had, thanks to a guy named Bill Acree, who was the traveling secretary for the Braves for years, I had been granted a long sit down with Dion earlier in the season. And, and he was playing, he was hitting 300. I mean, he was a good baseball player. And he was, Dion is very smart and, and, and very articulate. And um, we had a great talk, but at one point he had that, at that point he cut off the Atlanta media for some reason. I can't even remember why, but I asked him about it. He said, they had a privilege, they abused the privilege, they lost the privilege, which is a little bit of egomaniacal, but okay. And I was talking to a guy named Terry Moore, who was a columnist in Atlanta uh, that weekend. And Terry was writing, you know, everybody was writing about Dion's publicity stunt. And I made the mistake of repeating the line, which just selfishly, I should have saved for the book. Terry wrote the line in the paper on Saturday. And Dion came after me in the locker room after the game. You know, I gave you all that time. And then you give this, this guy who's out to get me this quote. And you know what? He was right. But we went off in the corner because he had the camera crew following. I said, Dion, I'm not talking to you with the camera crew here. We went off in a corner, we talked it out, 
And Dion, to his credit, said, okay, you know, you're right. He, he said, I can't remember if he said, I'm right. He said, I got it. We're good. So 12 years later, here I am doing a book on the Ravens, and Dion shows up right at the end of the exhibition season. And I remember um, somebody introduced us uh, and said, John, do you know Dion? And I said, well, I, Dion, we, we knew each other because I didn't know if he'd remember. I said, John, I remember. It was when I was playing for the Braves. Yeah, good to see you. And he could not have been better. The whole season, he was great to hang out with. Um, and unfortunately, I hung out with him a fair bit because he was hurt. And I would stand with him on the sidelines during games because it was like getting, again, as I said about Bob Woodward in journalism, it was like getting a PhD in, in football. He would point out a lineman's footwork, the way a lineman was lining up with his feet, and he would say, and he'd call the play. I, he was a football genius, uh, and the way he played – you know, made that clear. And he also played very well when he was healthy. So he was a great character. And the thing I, I will always love Dion for is this. The next year, because he stayed two years, he was doing an interview on the radio with my longtime friend, Tony Kornheiser. And this was back when Tony was was doing radio full time. And I, no, I don't think the football, no, no, the, the TV show had started by then. And Tony says to me, he says to Dion, he says, God, it must have been a pain in the neck to have to hang out with Feinstein all that time. And Dion said, Feinstein was great. I loved hanging out with him. But I could, if I'd been in the room with him, I'd have kissed him at that moment because it clearly upset Kornheiser that Dion liked me. I would love to get uh, Dion and Tony in a room together for an hour and just listen to what that conversation is like. <laughs> but, uh, it, it would be two of the smarter people you know. I guarantee you that. Yeah, I big fans of both of them. Um, and yeah, the Dion thing I thought was really interesting because as somebody who was nine years old at the time the season is going on, I don't, I don't remember a ton of him like as a player, but I think you impressed really well kind of the impact that he had on that team and uh, just really fascinating to look back on. But uh, another character kind of in the midst of like a really strange situation uh, was obviously Jamal Lewis kind of facing... What even at the time, I think you described it pretty well, and I think it's pretty clearly easy to look back on as something that was kind of a little bit of maybe a trumped up drug distribution charge. Uh, what was what was kind of the read, the first read you got on Jamal, and what was it like being in camp with that kind of hanging over the team's head? Well, it did hang over the team's head. That's a good description because I, Jamal was, was a huge star by then. I think that was the, the year before he'd rushed for, I think, 1,850 yards. Uh, and, and then he had to go to jail. Uh, during the off season because they brought back a charge from when he was a kid um, and said, okay, we're sending, we're putting you in jail for a couple months. And Jamal handled it remarkably well. I mean, when he came back, they had a press conference. And one of the things the Ravens have always done well, whether it's with Kevin Byrne then or Chad Steele now is they know how to deal with PR. Um, Kevin was a pro. He taught Chad, who's a pro. Um, and uh, Chad is the son, by the way, you, you may or may not be aware of the, the first African-American to play football at West Point, who is one of the all time great guys, by the way. Um, but, uh, I remember sitting in with Kevin and Jamal while Kevin coached Jamal up on how to deal with all the questions that were going to come that day. And I think sitting in that meeting, not only was instructional, but it also made it clear to Jamal that the team trusted me you know, to allow me to sit in on that meeting. And so when we, when he and I sat down to talk one-on-one, -on -one, uh, he was very honest about every, you know, he talked about the mistakes he'd made when he was younger and the regrets he had. And, and now he wanted to under, understandably to put it behind him, but he did not have nearly the season in 04 that he'd had in 03. Uh, and I don't know if that had anything to do with missing time during the off season uh, or if just the offense wasn't as good as it had been the year before. Definitely. And Jumping into the season itself uh, on that note, did you spend a lot of time on the sidelines? And if so, what is it like being that close to an NFL game? Because I can't imagine it's uh, something you can easily describe very well. Uh, I, I watched every game from the sidelines. Um, I wanted to be as close as I could. I also wanted access to get in and out of the locker room uh, before and during and after the games. Um, in, in the opening game at Cleveland, uh, Jamal Lewis came on a sweep. And I was, you know, everybody's backing up because the play is coming near us. I didn't get out of the way. I got bowled over and I'm lying on my back. And Jonathan Ogden wasn't playing that day because he was, he had a knee problem. And he, he comes over and he's standing over me, you know, six foot nine. And he says, don't get up. If you stay down, you'll get on television. <laughs> I said, I don't want to get on television lying flat on my back. 
Jonathan. I got, I was fine. The other thing I remember is Bruce Laird back then was in charge. The NFL always has a guy uh, at every game who checks on people's clothes, you know, to make sure that there aren't socks with logos on it. You know, you hear all the just time really, that. really important stuff. Yeah, clearly. And, 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 but that was Bruce's job. And Bruce, one of the great guys. And so during the first home game, because the first game was at Cleveland, during the first home game, um, uh, one of the equipment guys, Darren Kearns, walks over to me in the second quarter or something, and he hands me a Ravens cap. And he says, put this on. And I don't like to wear clothes with any team's logo because I'm not part of any team. And I said, well, Darren, what are you talking about? And he said, Just, he said, put the cap on. And I said, why? And he said, because... Bruce says that according to NFL rules, if you are on the sideline, you have to be wearing something with a team logo on it to identify you as being okay to be on the sidelines. Nowadays, by the way, if I was doing the book this year, they wouldn't let me on the sidelines. The NFL has, before COVID, the NFL basically shut down sideline access. Reporters, you know, the people who cover a game in the old days, you were allowed to go down on the sideline the last five minutes of the game. Now they won't let anybody down there before or after the game. So I was lucky that when I was doing the book, those rules didn't exist. Yeah. And I guess like jumping further into the season for a team with Super Bowl hopes, like we touched on, you mentioned the, the opening loss at Cleveland. You're up close and personal then for the next, obviously, three weeks, and it's a two and two start. And I think with an emotional coach like Billick, they obviously have a similar guy in some regards in Harbaugh now. But with Billick especially, I feel like that had to be kind of a roller coaster ride. Do you remember where his head was at after that first quarter of the season when they're 500? Well, if you remember, uh, I described what it was like around the facility the Monday after the loss to Cleveland because there are only 16 games. So you lose uh, a game. It's like a 10-game losing streak in baseball. Uh, I mean, it, you feel like you're walking on eggshells, you know, and you, you don't, you don't want to talk that day. That Monday was the only time I asked Billick for some time. And he said, no, In the entire experience. He said, just not today. He said, tomorrow's fine. You know, when the players aren't here, um, he said, not today. No problem. That's the beauty of writing a book is you have the luxury of time, but uh, it, it was an uptight place. Um, Billick is, you know, wasn't successful by coincidence. He was an intense coach. He was not at all happy um, with the way they played. And they did bounce, excuse me, bounce back and play very well against the Steelers the following Sunday. Uh, but it wasn't, I, I was, I actually sat the, the one half all season. I didn't, I wasn't on the sideline. I sat the first half in the coach's box because I wanted to get a sense of that. And um, Mike Nolan, very intense guy, and Matt Cavanaugh, who was the offensive coordinator under fire, um, almost got into it during the game because Cavanaugh made a call. I, I think he, he he called a trick play for a deep pass when the defense had just been on the field for a while. And Nolan was like, what are you doing? The defense needs a rest. And, and Mike came into the offensive room the next day. I was in there and, and apologized to Cavanaugh and said, look, I was wrong, blah, blah. But it was an uptight place to answer your question. Yeah. And uh, I, I didn't even write this down either, but like that, I mean, that's almost a, uh, a legendary like staff behind Billick there. You have Singletary, obviously you have Nolan, two guys that would both funny enough go on to become 49er head coaches uh, right. within a couple Mike years. Took, Mike Nolan took Mike Singletary with him yep. to San Francisco. They were close friends. Yeah, ex exactly. So you have those two, you have Kavanaugh in the mix. So I thought was a really fascinating character. What was kind of it? What was it like following those guys behind Billick who seemed to be kind of that, I think Ray Lewis described him as like a big brother character. What was it kind of like following those guys, like trying to, because both of them like, and Mike Nolan in particular was kind of looking at a head coaching job. What was kind of that whole dynamic like? You know, it's funny because Mike uh, had no idea who I was when I first showed up on the scene and, and kind of quizzed me a little bit about, you know, who are you? Why are you here? What are you trying to do? Um, and uh, we ended up becoming very close. Uh, he walked up to me at one point uh, on the sidelines during practice and he said, aren't you kind of a big time writer? And I said, well, I don't know what your definition of a big time writer is. He says, but someone who's done what you've done, what's with the shoes? Cause I usually own one pair of shoes and one pair of sneakers. 
And um, the shoes I was wearing at that point were getting near the end. And I said, well, they're comfortable or, or something like that. Well, a few weeks later, he showed up one day with a pair of shoes that his wife had bought for me. Uh, and they fit. <laughs> and so we became friends. And Singletary was, God, was he intense. Just being in a room with him, he almost wanted, he, he, he coached like he played linebacker. Um, and uh, a lot of the, a lot of what you got from Singletary, though, as you get with a lot of people in football, was about his relationship with God. Um, and I, again, I have no problem with that it, it, as long as it's real. And with Mike, it was certainly real. Kavanaugh was, I'm, I, I really like Matt Kavanaugh. He, he was under fire all year. He never backed away from giving me time or giving me honest answers about he, how he felt about the situation. I sat and talked to him in his office the day he got fired. You know, he, I mean, most guys would be said, let me get the hell out of here. And he just sat for 30 minutes or whatever it was and, and told me that it, he wasn't shocked. The team had been disappointing. They'd been nine and seven. Bowler hadn't had a great year. Um, the offense hadn't had a great year. Uh, and then he, of course, went on and became the coordinator at the University of Pittsburgh the next year. Um, so, which is his alma mater. So I, I, I was, I was a fan of all three guys in different ways. Right. And right around that mid season that you kind of hit on there, uh, they make their move into the new facility, which we all know very well now is the castle is what they call it. And yeah, they were in the, uh, the old Colts facility over, which is what I now believe is Stevenson university or right around the corner from where I live. I know a college bought out the facility. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe it was Villa Julie, now Stevenson. It was Villa Julia at the time, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's something that I can't think of has happened in my time watching football. Maybe I just have blank spots and it has, but like, what was it like being in the mix for them moving mid season? And do you think that had like a really tangible effect on the team morale? Hard to say that it did. I, I mean, the new facility was definitely an upgrade. Uh, from the old one, that's for sure. I mean, the locker room was like four times the size of, of the old one, and um, the, the, the practice fields were, were better. And it, it was definitely an upgrade for everybody. But it was an adjustment because you're used to a place. You know, you, you, you know where you're going. You know what the traffic is. I mean, the guys had to learn, including me, how to get there. You know, where do you turn? Where do you make a right? Where do you make a left? Um, so it definitely was unique in that they made it, they, it, it was, the facility was supposed to be ready before the season and you know how construction is. There were delays and, and all of a sudden they end up making the move in October. I believe they made it during the bye week Yep. and that made it a little bit easier because there was time to get in there, get acclimated and then start the next week's preparation, uh, in a place where you were already set up, but it definitely, uh, w was different and. Um, I mean, they went from the meeting room where everybody, because the, the coaches and the scouts would meet every Monday. And in the old facility, uh, a lot of the guys had to stand. There just wasn't room for everybody to sit in the new facility. You could have fit twice as many guys into the meeting room. Yeah. And after all the fireplace. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really nice. I haven't been inside, but I've been there and, uh, it's, you know, it's still to this day, really an awesome facility, but after all that, you know, they wind they expanded it in the last couple of years. Too. Yeah, they have. They put in a bubble and everything, and it's uh, they're still still doing a really nice job with it. And they wind up at five and three halfway through the season. It's a relatively good spot. I think they expected to be a little bit better based on what you were describing. But I'm curious at that point what the messaging of like I've hit on Billick plenty here. I'm curious about like what the messaging of somebody like Ray Lewis was at the time, who you mentioned was he had the Thursday, you know, get togethers with the guys at his house and everything. I'm curious, like, was the messaging from him, do you think it was just kind of stay the course, or were you starting to see some of the cracks that eventually hurt the team to show up at that point? I wouldn't say I saw cracks. The, the Monday night loss to Kansas City was was disappointing because Kansas City wasn't all that good, and they pretty much blew them out. I remember that. Uh, and that was a downer uh, in the entire locker room. And, and Billick was very upset about not just that they lost, but the way they lost. But I think for Ray, Ray was always upbeat. I mean, Ray, Ray, and now maybe when he got together, I did not go to any of those meetings at his house, but uh, maybe there he, he got on guys. But when he was in the locker room, it was, it was always, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to win. Um, and even after losses in the locker room, he, he was, he was upbeat. You know, he, his big saying was, fellas, it's just football. It's you know, as in, come on, let's just move on from this. And, and I think that was, that's a good approach. And, and, uh, but again, injuries be started to become a factor. Uh, you know, I remember them winning that game at the Jets against the Jets when Cordell Stewart had to punt 
Um, but, uh, you know, like you said, at five and three, I don't think anybody was panicking. Right. And I think I maybe asked that about Lewis specifically because I'm curious about somebody who I think was maybe a little bit of a foil to him. Uh, you know, there were a ton of turbulent personalities, really, but I think Chris McAllister is a guy who kind of, for Ravens fans, he kind of personifies untapped potential in some ways. I'm curious, what was it like being on both sides of the situation with Chris, where you see some of his issues start to bubble up, and then you're also in meetings with guys like Billick and Bashadi discussing what to do with him? You actually have a really good scene where Bashadi talks about going to him and talking to him man to man. What was that whole kind of situation like? McAllister was a fascinating character um, because he he was he was very smart, uh, but at times he, like a lot of people, he was not self aware. And he often saw his problems, some of which were connected to drinking, um, as being created by others. And he and I, I think, developed a good relationship. I told him very honestly when he started to talk about drinking that I, I, my mother was an alcoholic. And being an alcoholic doesn't make you a bad person. And I think for a while, Chris looked at himself as being a bad person because of, of drinking. Um, and my mother was a great person, by the way. And uh, but but he became kind of a focal point for the team's leadership. You're right about that meet. I still remember that meeting because uh, Chris had gotten beaten on a key play. I think it was the day after they lost to the Bengals at home, and and he was bad in the game. And how late had he been out Saturday night? And how much was he partying? And 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 Steve, um, Steve's certainly not an alcoholic, but he likes to drink just like I do. Um, and he said, I'm, I'm going to go talk to him because I'm going to talk to him about dealing with drinking, about being a man and, and about how much he wants the, the contract. Um, cause I remember, uh, when, who was it who got the long-term contract during the season? I, 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 I'm forgetting now, but somebody, maybe it's Ed Reed signed a long-term contract during the season. And I was on the field. It was before they, they played in Washington on a Sunday night and the shot he's on the field and, Ed Reed, who I think it was, or maybe it was Ogden, but one of the stars, uh, Bashadi comes over and he hugs Ed Reed. Um, and, and, uh, and McAllister's right behind. And he says to Steve, I'm next. And Steve says something like, yeah, I hope so. And of course it did work out. He did get a long-term contract, but uh, his play, his up and down play was very much an issue throughout that season. Definitely. You had kind of his drama. You had the, the Jamal Lewis thing carried throughout pretty much the entire season. They wind yeah. up at eight and five. You hit on the fact that they kind of faltered down the stretch. They go one and two to finish out at nine and seven. I'm curious what it's like to be in the atmosphere of a building where they're very much in the hunt, but they know how difficult it's going to be to close the season out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they, they had to play at Indy. And of course, Peyton Manning was still king of the hill or co-king of the hill with brady in in those days uh and then they had to play at pittsburgh uh rematch of, of the second week game in baltimore so they they knew they had their work cut out for them with those two games i mean you couldn't look at either of those games and say that's a win um and i, I my memory is that they played very well in indy and and, and, and indy just made plays at the end and, and won the game um but that's not good enough uh, playing well in the NFL isn't the goal. And so I, I, I remember that game. It was snowing like crazy in Indianapolis. Of course, they're playing in a dome. Uh, but I remember that game vividly. And I, I remember the handshake between uh, Billick and Tony Dungy because they'd been on the same staff in Minnesota together and they were friends. And at the very end of the game, the, uh, the, the um, Colts had intercepted a bowler pass and um, – Manning was on the verge of like breaking one of Dan Marino's records. I think it was for most touchdown passes in a season. And they were on the 10 yard line and Dungy knelt twice and the fans were booing like crazy because they wanted to see Manning break the record. <laughs> I, when Billick and Dungy shook hands with one another, Billick said, you're a much better guy than I am. I would have thrown the ball in the end zone and gotten that touchdown pass for, for Manning, but you're, you're, and Dungy is that kind of good guy, by the way. And the other in that game, Ray Lewis broke his wrist. And that was critical uh, because, you know, he's the key to the defense. And he insisted he was going to play in Pittsburgh. And they shot him up 
Um, there's a lot in the book about guys, you know, taking pain killing shots to get on the field. Nothing against the rules, just a fact of life in the NFL. And I never forget in that game, uh, in the early in the fourth grade, he got another shot at halftime because he was already in pain. It's a broken wrist. Yeah. And in midway in the fourth quarter, the the shot had worn off. And uh, Jerome Bettis went straight up the middle, and Ray went to tackle him, and he. he Bettis hit him right on the wrist as, as he was bringing him down. And I remember seeing Ray's knees crumple. And he literally had to crawl off the field. He was in so much pain. I can't even imagine how much that hurt. But that moment to me was symbolic in many ways of their season because they'd been brought to their knees by the Steelers. The Steelers beat him fairly handily that day. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a long trip. Pittsburgh's a short trip, but it was a long trip home. Yeah, I think that's a great sort of anecdote to kind of wrap that regular season discussion up on. And my overarching question on it would be like, how would you best explain, like you just mentioned on sort of fighting through the pain and the painkillers, how would you best explain the other ins and outs of an NFL season to an audience that maybe isn't able to fully appreciate everything that goes on and just how difficult it can be to win in the league? Because I feel like these days, especially with fantasy football, it just people kind of look at it as this like plug and play video game type thing, but there's just so much human element that goes into it. How would you best kind of overarchingly describe that? You know, Kevin Byrne said to me at one point during the season, you realize you've been given access to a secret society. And, and, and that's what the NFL really is. It is a secret society with all the we talk about insiders. Nobody's really an insider. Um, but I think that what, what people can't understand uh, without living it is that, especially nowadays, most sports are, if not 12 months a year, at least 11. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Buccaneers and Chiefs will start getting ready for OTAs or what, again, COVID makes everything different. But if everything it gets resolved, the, these guys start getting ready to play latest in the spring. Uh, the draft is a big deal within the, the, the draft and free agency. I mean, right now, the Ravens are preparing for the draft and free agency. You know, how do we get a better, better wide receivers? Do we do it through the draft? Do we do it through free agency? You hear all the talk about quarterbacks being moved. Uh, the Ravens are fortunate in that they've got a, an, an MVP type of quarterback, so they don't have to worry about that. But uh, it, it never stops. You know, that could have been the title of the book too. It never stops. I went with Next Man Up because the injuries that affected the season were so critical. Uh, to the Ravens. It's funny. I hear people say next man up all the time. I didn't hear that term until I wrote the book. I'm not saying I invented it, but I don't think it was used as much then as it is now. Um, but there, there, there's a never ending cycle uh, within a, a, an organization for, for coaches, for front office people, for scouts and for the players, the players get a little time off the, the, the people who are, coaching them or putting the team together, they really don't get time off. Right. And walking away from the project as a neutral party, what was kind of your overall take on the Ravens as an organization? And obviously it's been a ton of years since then. What's it been like watching those guys you covered that year make their way throughout the league? Well, I, I think they're one of the, they've been one of the better organizations in football. Uh, you know, uh, they've only had two coaches in this century, uh, Billick and Harbaugh, uh, e each won a Super Bowl. Uh, Ozzie, you know, obviously is if Ozzie had not been a hall of fame player, he would have to be a hall of fame general manager, uh, first African-American, uh, to, to hold the job, even though he wasn't given the title till after he'd won a super bowl, uh, and then wins his second super bowl. He's also, you know, if you, as you go into the 2020s, he'll be remembered as the guy who drafted Lamar Jackson when all these other teams overlooked him and took the, the four guys in the top 10. Uh, and the only one who's, who's even comparable at, to Lamar in any way is Jake Allen. Um, Sam Darnold's probably going to be traded. Uh, Baker Mayfield had a good year, but he's not Lamar Jackson. Uh, and uh, Josh Rosen has been a complete flame out. Uh, so uh, Ozzie, you know, what Ozzie's done in the NFL as a player and as a general manager is historic. As I said to him, as I mentioned, I said to him earlier, um, Bishotti is one of the uh, better owners 
that I've known in sports uh, because he understands that getting rich in business doesn't mean you know football. Now he's been around, he's owned the team now since 2003. So, and he's a smart guy. So I'm sure he's figured some things out about football, but the smart, the smartest thing he's done is he's let his football people do their thing. Um, and you, you know, I, I, I've, I've lost touch with Kyle Bowler. I feel bad about that because he was su such a good guy and we did stay in touch for a while. Uh, even after he left Baltimore. Um, and, uh, you know, I still see uh, players from that team on occasion when I go up to, to games uh, at M&T Bank Stadium. And, and uh, I, you know, I, Dick Cass remains somebody I, I enjoy seeing. Kevin Byrne and, and Chad Steele, as I mentioned, could not have been more helpful to me during several projects, including my current one. Um, so it's been nice. You know, I grew up a Jets fan. I, I grew up in New York. Uh, I was, I, I was, I'm old enough that I was alive for the Super Bowl. Um, they've done virtually nothing since then. Uh, and, but I, I, I realized watching the Ravens play the Jets that season in New Jersey that I wanted the Ravens to win just because I knew the people so well. Uh, and it, Herm Edwards was the coach, a guy I like, and Bob Sutton was his, his defensive coordinator who I knew from my Army Navy project and was one of the, a great guy. But I still wanted the Ravens to win. And when the Ravens do play the Jets, I still pull for the Ravens. The rest of the time, I pull for the Jets. So I think if there was a big change in my life because of that book, it's that I found a team to root for that wins sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I'm also really fascinated by Bowler, too. I'd, I'd love to sit down with him for this show sometime. My brother actually caddied for him at Caves Valley. He said he was a really, really He's nice good guy. player. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and my last question for you here is, if you could go back, or maybe let's say like do this nowadays, like, if you can go back and do a project like this all over again at your current age with your current perspective, do you expect My your current age is an important question? <laughs> do you think your approach would like differ at all? What do you what do you kind of look back on as something that maybe you do differently, or do you just kind of look back on it with just pure fond memories? I don't think I, I you know I, I've been doing this a long time, as you know. Um, I don't think I do anything differently in a reporting sense. Uh, I, I think I. I got to the guys who were most important and they did open up to me. I think that does come through in the book. I think my access as, as has been the case in many of my books was critical to the book's success. It was very well received. It did make the New York times bestseller list, which is always a goal, even though it shouldn't be, but it is. Um, and, uh, I, and so, no, I, I don't think there's, you know, I, you'd obviously have a different cast of characters now and, John Harbaugh is very different than, than Brian Billick. And Eric DaCosta is very different than Ozzie Newsom. Eric's much more comfortable talking to the media than Ozzie. And Eric and I still have a very good relationship. Um, so I, the cast of characters would be different. I don't know that I would be that different. I hope I'd have as much energy now um, in my 60s as I did when I was in my 40s. Definitely. Well, John, this was a really, really fun chat. I appreciate you hopping on here with me for over an hour on this uh, this Monday morning. Uh, before I get you out of here, you got anything you want to plug, social media, anything you're working on? Well, uh, I always have things to, to plug, Jake. Um, I have a, I mean, my um, Twitter handle is at Jay Feinstein Books. My um, uh, website is at jfeinsteinbooks.com. And if you go to at jfeinsteinbooks.com, you'll find a link to something called Story Time, which is uh, I do three times a week. I release videos that are about four or five minutes long, excuse me. And they're stories that I haven't told in my books for the most part, behind the scenes stories. Um, and I, uh, for example, last week I did a couple on how I almost got arrested in Czechoslovakia and how I got in trouble in, in the Soviet Union excuse me, on that same trip. Um, and people seem to really enjoy the story time videos, especially people who like my writing. Uh, I have a, a new kids book out. I started writing kids mysteries about 15 years ago, a new kids book out um, that's called Game Changers. Uh, it's for sixth grade and up, fifth grade and up maybe, if you're a good reader. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I'm currently working on a book on race and sports that'll come out before Christmas. Awesome. Well, thanks a ton for joining me, sir. Uh, it was a really, really fun chat. I think our audience is going to like this one. You have yourself a great rest of your week, okay? Thanks, Jake. Thanks for having me.
All right, thanks a lot. Appreciate you guys. See you later. <laughs> All right, God bless. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs>